Module 2, Skills Development and Research and Development R&D. Objectives to capture the need for skills and knowledge acquisition, to appreciate the status and constraints, uh, possible solutions, and examples how these can be achieved. We will follow the following agenda. Status of skills and knowledge in key sector, sector groups. Knowledge and skills requirements for mineral development. The case for skills upgrading, collaboration in skills development, research and development. Linkages and diversification, spatial development As a background, um, uh, there was a report that reviewed the implementation of the AMV, which revealed the need for strategy, management, and monitoring system. Um, it also revealed the need for ac that activities should be implemented by member states with the help of partners. It also emphasized the need for full participation of all stakeholders at all levels, country, regional, and continental. There was another report um, that looked at mining skills on the continent which showed that there was insufficient capacity across all stakeholders, government, private sector, civil society, in varying proportions, of course, depending um, um, on a country's position. And um, there was insufficient capacity, staff capacity and capability and infrastructure, and these are key aspects and key components for the delivery of the um, of the MV. In broad terms, the the requirements for mineral development may be classified as follows. Um, you can group one in regulation, which are economic regulations, environmental regulations, social regulations, that specifically for the sector. Um, you, in the next one will be infrastructure, physical infrastructure, financial infrastructure, digital and IT infrastructure. Then human capital, um, mining education, training and skills development, and knowledge management. R&D, you talk in terms of innovation, technology development, design and development. And you can group, you can group all those with the relevant stakeholders, which would be government, industry, communities, civil society organizations. At the top of it, of course, are academic institutions. So we will be referring to all of these as we, as we try along. Skills development in government, or rather the nature of skills in government. The report found out that the governments, most governments, uh, um, um, struggle to find local people with the requisite skills for some vacancies, not all of them. So these depend, of course, from country to country where they will have problems in certain skills that are lacking. They also struggle to keep professionals abreast of te technological developments in their fields. 
it, it, it shows here that you need consistent human professional development with time. Um, in other cases, typically they lack practical experience in mind inspectorate. In other words, to 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 monitor operations in the mining sector for compliance. They are also experience inadequate staffing and thinly spread across centers of mineral resources management. They uh, also see inability to compete uh, with remuneration of industry and abroad and hence unable to, to retain the required staff. There are also uh, weaknesses in um, expertise in certain areas, for example, taxation, community relations, negotiations, and so on. Um, others complained about outdated infrastructure and equipment to manage, to manage the sector responsibilities. Of course, countries have differed from uh, competences in, 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 in these aspects. But in essence, you can actually see that there are certain areas that governments still need to emphasize, but it all depends on what the national objectives are. In industry, the studies show that a, num you know, a good set of prof trained professionals leave for opportunities elsewhere. Um, they also complain that certain skills are not available locally and hence have to rely on, on um, expatriates. Locals have very strong theoretical background and without necessary practical training and inadequate artisanal skills. These are skills that are below the the engineering um, BSc level. So you could see that there are er elements here which we will need to to work in terms of training. Just like in governments, there are pockets of competences in some countries. The reports also showed that where civil society was concerned, um, they found that, that mining communities have very low literacy and numeracy skills. Um, secondly, poor engagement among government, mining communities, my, and mining companies. Um, thirdly, few NGOs are involved in the mining sector. Fourthly, there are inadequate, there is inadequate funding available to NGOs to do their work of um, um, monitoring governance. Improved access to information regarding um, um, the mining sector. Inadequate capacity of community leaders and communities in mining issues and insufficient capacity on the ground to drive sustainability initiatives beyond mining. So these are, they identify key areas that require attention. Even though at regional levels, there are competencies, for example, TWA and SAW, um, um, TJNA and ZERA, among others, which have been very active in mineral resource governance. And uh, in most cases, they've been at the forefront popularizing the uh, African mining vision. Where academic institutions are concerned, uh, most of them need infrastructure support. They need strengthening staff capacity and capabilities. Um, they need support of students' scholarships. 
they need support of academic chairs, for instance, to manage um, research. And of course, in other aspects, they needed assistance in they needed um, assistance in the development appropriate curriculum. So there are, of course, considerable differences between institutions across the continent. But in broad terms, you can tend to get concerned that we really need, this is an area that is uh, critical for spearheading the implementation of the AMV. The case for skills upgrading. Against this background, there is need to strengthen the capacity of member states and regional communi economic communities to implement the AMV. So, as we've seen from above, um, upgrading is required in all sectors, government, industry, civil society, academia, and communities. Now, we do know that skill shortages limit productive capacity in higher value chains and more innovative government procedures. At the higher level, we must deal with these issues. High, therefore, higher value products are achieved only through increased skills and knowledge. It's, we cannot just simply complain about, about downstream processing and various other things. We really need to pay critical attention in skills um, upgrading. Raw or semi-processed commodities offer little room for innovation and employment creation, which could have beneficial spin-offs, like empowering women, the youth, and the poor. And therefore, education should not be viewed as a social sector only, but also as a core sector for the productive economy. And therefore, it is thus necessary to identify needed skills. The primary role of government, therefore, is to coordinate various interests and affected stakeholders and partners um, in policy coordination, developing regional and national accreditation frameworks, etc. Um, it must facilitate collaboration between various stakeholders to balance the needs of society and the supply of skills and knowledge. Such collaboration is shown in the diagram here. You have successful skills de development at the apex. What is the role of government uh, on the left here? As we all know, it must provide basic education, basic education, secondary education, technical and vocational training, tertiary education, which are universities, must provide appropriate legislation, and it has, must also provide appropriate incentives. It also abstract, abstracts um, skills levies from industry in certain, in most countries, which fund some of these um, um, technical and vocational training uh, aspects. What is expected of industry, of course, industry to provide in company training. When they do that, they do they provide training for the requirements that they want themselves to extract um, safely and economically um, and they also uh, provide corporate social responsibility to to mining communities and for them to 
to supply goods and services that they need. They also um, could also offer uh, accreditation for various levels of skills that are required. Together, government and industry can jointly subsidize uh, technical and vocational educational training programs. Together, they can fund student bursaries. Together, they can support staff salaries in, in, in universities, in, in, in universities that teach um, um, technical aspects. Together, they can fund research. Together, both industry and government can identify the skills gaps and develop programs for, for, for um, um, skills acquisition and development and so on. They together can harmonize industry policies and government policies to make sure that the necessary skills are required which are useful and relevant for the industry. So that these aspects can be done jointly between industry and government for successful skills development. At the other end, at the regional economic communities, the industry, governments, now governments, can work together to develop education and extractive industries protocols in order that they work together. They can they work together towards standardization of curriculum qualifications and this then allows mobility of of skills across borders within Africa because these are these are standardized these are these then will have a common goal you will then you will then um, meet one very key critical component which you can then together use regional facilities because you have standardized um, curriculum qualifications. You can use regional facilities because then the training that is being abstract or that is being created can be utilized anyway. The RECs can also provide exchange students, staff, joint research within countries and industries. The RECs can provide policy and the institutional improvements. It, it can also be able to facilitate funding sources for various programs. It also provides opportunities for continuing professional development. You remember, as we said earlier on, that um, staff needs to keep abreast of technological development. So these can be done at sub-regional um, level. And at the sub-regional level can also facilitate cross-country training. So these are done together with industry, government, and sub-regional organizations in order that the benefits accrue to regional member states from natural resources development. There are a number of training models that can be used, of course, um, depend depending upon the target audience. Um, COVID-19, in fact, um, has shown us that there is a fair amount of training that can be made online and be attended by many participants. Um, some of the models that 
that um, that are available, not necessarily online, but both online and physical, are short courses, inter-country study tours, and country programs. So these country programs, uh, the country tours and programs, provide peer learning and sharing experiences. These are very critical. And they take the form of lectures, seminars, visits to operations and so on, and, and, and educational uh, research um, establishment, etc. cetera. Um, others are undergraduate programs postgraduate support programs, um, um, regional economic community interlinkages, and economic and technical capacity building. So all these are models that can be thought through and be utilized in order to deliver the country mining visions. So these can be delivered through country programs, RECs, and various partnerships. Research and development. Higher value products can only be achieved through skills, knowledge, and innovation. We know that. And, and therefore, um, innovation requires investments in R&D. All segments of the mining industry ideally should undertake R&D right from exploration to mine closure. And, and these are not just the horizontal but all and how they relate to other sectors of the economy. There are many problems in the sector's sp uh, sphere that require different types of skills and levels. Of course, um, as we said earlier on, they, they, um, they cross a call, uh, across all stakeholders, government, industry, academia, uh, civil society, and so on. For example, there are society and political issues that should aim to, to, to improve mining practice in all its segments, which might encompass mining and development, sustainable development, environment, legislation, and so on. So the definition of research and development would include increasing efficiency of mineral extraction practices and product development. So emphasis should not just be on product development but in the whole range of issues um, that impinge on mineral extraction. For example, um, this graph here shows um, that countries that have higher expenditure in R&D do well in innovation. This is uh, on the left there you see R&D expenditure as a percentage of GDP, right? You see the United States there that is sitting at above 2.5 um, over the past uh, years from 2000 to, to 2015. The second one is our OECD members. Um, the third one you could see there is um, Australia that went up and, and peaked at around um, 2000 and 2000 and uh, mid 2008, and then tapered a little bit downwards, um, which are above the world average. And under there you see Canada for some reason tapered down um, after, um, after 2011. Um, um, China has uh, uh, 
improved its expenditure on R and D. South Africa is still at the low end here. Um, so usually, these countries invest more in internet access and uh, availability. So you, when you look at the world average, there, there, the, in this group here, there are only those three that are doing well. They have more highly skilled work workforce than those that spend less on R and D, and hence, for us to participate, we really need to up our games in R and D. Now, in case where the mineral sector is concerned, is the whole range of things. These things will include social sciences, law, politics, management, human and community relations, economics, basic economics, finance, accounting and money management, humanities, including philosophy, um, languages, history, engineering, the whole range of engineering things, uh, science, um, the whole range of science, environmental, biology, mathematics, chemistry, and so on. So, in that, you could actually see that it's all sectors are in are affected or affect or participate in the area of mineral resources, and this provides an opportunity for most all mineral producing countries to promote R&D in any area of mineral value chain to improve local activities and provide opportunities for shared experiences with others. So it's you don't necessarily just have to have advanced R&D equipment to undertake R&D and there are all these areas that can improve resources development. For academic institutions, it is critical to encourage interdisciplinary and collaborative R&D. Interdisciplinary in terms of all those areas that we covered in the previous slide that shows harmony between uh, the various aspects of the mineral value chain. Um, it promotes borrowing ideas from other disciplines to provide crossover, of course, employment opportunities. Um, for example, political scientists um, participating in mineral law, um, economists on models of revenue generation, and so on. Um, collaboration between African universities is so important, so critical, because not all universities have the same facilities. Um, they have different strengths, actually. And they can collaborate between themselves. And um, those that collaborate with foreign universities will, will the, those that do not collaborate with the uh, foreign universities will have opportunities to to benefit from the others in order to 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 tap into what is out there globally linkages and diversification this aims to promote linkages between the mining sector and others and other economic and social activities um, um, value chain, uh, by definition, is a sequence of production of value-adding activities leading to and supporting end users of a particular product. The process is from exploration, which is inception, to final consumption of the final good. So, um, it, it actually encourages the analysis, encourages investigation of the distribution of that value among various actors 
and promotes the search for upgrading strategies. Um, the search analysis, of course, has a geographical dimension. You can do that locally within the country and then linking to the region at the regional economic community level from and then from there linking to international or or global depending upon the processes of that value of that mineral value chain um, at the national level it is important to know which links are within and how profitable and potential for bringing additional links in other words you the analysis um, facilitates the understanding of the distribution of returns from the different activities of the chain so what what it does is to in, is 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 to involve the breaking into component parts helping to understand the structure and functioning and assessing the scope uh, to check for competitiveness. So at each stage, you want to find out what the inputs that are required and what the benefits are and what needs to be done in order that the value chain um, is taken as far down as possible towards a final consumption product. It also highlights the chain coordination and shows a pattern of control called governance in the um, value chain. Um, for a mineral value chain, you can, this diagram here shows the various types of linkages the upstream linkages define requirements, inputs into a mining operation. The mining operation, of course, will be exploration mining and, and, the, and the processing and so on. So you have upstream linkages. You have level one, which actually supply to the mining operation, which obtain their inputs from levels two and three and so on at some point there they should be manufacturing and integrating with other with other industries so so that that's where you now uh, link and call that lateral migration um the the mining sector itself there will have side stream linkages because they will rely on infrastructure r and d and skills financial services communications these are all side stream that go into into the various stages of the value chain and then downstream linkages are the utilization of the raw materials, the materials that come of mining into processing right down to end use. So that is down. So all these require various types of skills. Now, governments can make initiatives for other sectors to take decisions in a range of these activities to, meet, to be domesticated in the national economy. First and then, first point is to understand what these activities are as we we'll define them there and then governments can make initiatives for other actors to take decisions in a range of these activities so capacity development will require understanding the value chains of minerals for national or regional development and integration this then leads to the critical issue of skills in assessing information for these opportunities it's very important um what uh, imports what are produced what uh, what data is this is needed for decisions to be made and actions to be taken 
At each stage of the value chain, a decision is made whether benefits exceed costs. And if, if costs exceed benefits at a stage, this will likely imply that government is subsidizing business, or in short, the taxpayer is carrying the burden. So these decisions are policy decisions uh, object, uh, which are determined at the uh, national level. The next is to mob mobilizing, is mobilizing mining and infrastructure investment. Um, we appreciate and we do know, everybody knows, that Africa um, has a large infrastructure deficit, especially transport and energy. Um, so investment in mining projects uh, remain a constraint and you have a number of projects that remain stranded because of transport and energy. And not only that, it's um, not only for, for, for mining, but other sectors of the economy um, remain stranded um, because of transport and energy. So natural resources development corridors, in other words, um, um, promoting both infrastructure and mining investment. They provide a great opportunity for mobilizing investment um, in for for economic development. The spatial development initiative methodology in a defined development corridor project area. Um, entails the following elements of work. Right. First, you scope an area right, to find out if there is, there are potential opportunities for development. So first and foremost is to identify a viable um, anchor project, a mining project, and the associated um, main trunk infrastructure. Right. Now Mostly, with natural resources, mining projects are the only resources that are able to, to meet some, the, the, meet the um, costs necessary for infrastructure development. So, you need so once you have identified a project, a mining project as an anchor project and an associated trunk infrastructure that the other sectors can ride on, you need then to, uh, to look at um, existing or potential economic activities in other sectors of the economy that are close to the anchor project um, infrastructure. So um, you look, you take a, a scan of viable investment opportunities that can be developed if that infrastructure was put in place. And then you identify the feeder infrastructure that can then link from that opportunity um, investment, 
that can link into the trunk infrastructure that would be developed for a mining project. So these, so you then look at these projects to maximize forward and, 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 and backward linkages. And they will add, they will provide um, opportunities for the development of local supplier industries and and beneficiation as we saw from the previous uh, uh, diagram so you what then the next stage would be to remove the once you identify and remove um, uh, the constraint relating to the infrastructure um, um, policy and regulatory uh, issues for the promotion of investment this will promote broader investment in mining and other sectors of the economy so it is important to carry out project a proposal I mean appraisals um, to develop a portfolio of investment projects that can be tested for feasibility and for which appropriate funding models can be developed and engagement with with and mobilization of private sector interest through the development of uh, PPPs and appropriate uh, marketing strategies. Let's look at uh, the diagram here. Right up the top, for instance, you have you will have an anchor project. Let's have a mining project at the top there, anchor and cluster. So, in other words, you have an anchor pro project, which then has all the other aspects. You remember we said all the other linkages. Um, upstream downstream linkages that's the anchor with all those are uh, linkages which which are a cluster and you have a trunk infrastructure let's say a rail that goes to the other anchor at the right bottom here which is a port that takes what the mine has produced from the top in the middle you scope and for instance the 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 green one the agriculture project it could be agriculture project could be a, 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 um, a forest project could be a tourism project could be could be a fisheries project right and that project is stranded because in itself it cannot generate resources to um, for for infrastructure for infrastructure to get there road infrastructure or rare infrastructure so these stranded project could also be a small scale mining project this project this, these projects could be identified and find out what the requirements of linking to this trunk infrastructure that would be funded that would be that would be enabled by the by the anchor project obviously the anchor project the anchor infrastructure the trunk infrastructure would then be expanded in terms of capacity to take into account the development of the stranded projects and such feeders in this particular case problem feeder infrastructure would have to be funded by by governments or by donors in order to enhance development of those stranded projects so in other words 
this anchor project has facilitated the development of this trunk infrastructure which in itself would be funded by the project but through PPP, PPP can be expanded to support the output into and out of these stranded projects and each one of these projects will have clusters in terms of inputs, input requirements and also linkages to other aspects upstream and downstream and these all provide for these then would all provide for contribution to human well-being so this is um, an idealized spatial development initiative and infrastructure can be created to provide for all these stranded projects making effective contribution to the economy. So if the DC is a regional program involving two or more countries, it is necessary to obtain buy-in from the participating governments and formalize an agreement through our MOU and organizational arrangements, particularly um, regular um, bilateral meetings. A project manager must then be appointed to drive the formulation of a business plan um, which becomes his or her work contract. So you then have an action plan and you can assign responsibilities and so on. So from the experience gained on the South African Regional SDI program, um, it was evident that a number of critical success uh, success factors that determine the re relative success of any DC on which the SDI methodology is applied. These include one, obtaining initial political commitment and maintaining this throughout the SDI process. Secondly, installing adequate technical capacity to implement the SDI work program usually through in-country project management. You could actually see there that you require uh, a fair amount of technical capacity, which we should, cannot go into right now. Keeping stakeholders focused on the agreed conceptual business case for um, development corridor. Engaging in, in, in targeted interaction with the private sector, because they are the ones who are are going to invest in those potential stranded projects. You need a business case for those and institutional arrangements.